Và Suzanne dùm ý giải thích cho mình nghe được là trong một con xưởng thường lệ có công đoàn thì bằng cách nào mình có thể dùng để mà thử uh, trước đây là rượu và sau đây tương đương giống như là thử cần sa nhưng mà trong một tình hình mà không có công đoàn thì làm sao mình có thể thử và thử nó thay đổi như thế, thế nào um, So usually we talked about a safety requirements and more so um, a factory or similar paper and pulp or mill was what the case was based on and normally those are unionized workplaces Correct. so does that change in perhaps an office or non-unionized workplace well let's distinguish between an office and non-unionized so right. um, almost certainly any random drug testing in a non-safety sensitive environment whether it's unionized or not right. will not be permitted okay okay so any uh, environment where you're going to be able to justify random test testing has to be safety sensitive. Right. Um, but in a non-unionized environment, and frankly there's not a lot of case law in this area because the majority of the law has developed in, in a unionized setting, mm -hmm. um, but it's a little bit less restrictive and random testing is permitted where the employee works in a safety sensitive position and where workplace supervision is non-existent or minimal. Um, so in a non-unionized environment, an employer does not have to show that there is a general problem of substance abuse in the workplace. Prior to putting in testing policies? In order to implement random testing, which okay. it does have to prove in a unionized environment. Right. Um, and if we look at the most recent uh, Human Rights Commission policy, which dates from April of 2016, uh, it states that random on-the-job testing should only be done where a link's been established between impairment and the performance of job duties. Um, such as, in the case of employees who are in safety sensitive positions, uh, where the employer is able to demonstrate risk in the workplace and that staff supervision is minimal or non-existent. So I mean, does that mean that if you just have a high analysis, high computation job that is being affected, that doesn't meet the requirements? It has to also contain these additional criteria? Right, it has to be a safety sensitive right. environment. Um, and you know, again, we're still left with the, the issue of determining impairment. Um, and, you know, determining uh, impairment from alcohol is fundamentally different than determining impairment um, from marijuana use. Because of the technology, but the principles around it sort of are the same. Right, so legally the principles are the same. Right. Um, except that with alcohol we have a breathalyzer which has been found to be permissible under the Human Rights Code. And that's because testing by breathalyzer is seen to be minimally intrusive, so compared to a blood test, for example. Um, and as well, it's a highly accurate measure of both levels of consumption and actual impairment. Mm. Um, and therefore, random alcohol testing for safety-sensitive positions is acceptable in certain circumstances. Um, by contrast, although there have been some advances made, According to the Human Rights Commission policy, the scientific research hasn't yet gotten to the stage where we've got a method of drug testing that's analogous to a breathalyzer. Um, in terms of its ability to measure current impairment, uh, its level of accuracy, its minimum uh, level of intrusion, and also its rapid response time. Uh, trước đây, bà Suzanne đã giải thích cho mình nghe là trong những tình hình mà um, mình có một người công nhân làm việc trong một công ty mà phải dùng đến um, sức ví dụ như là lái xe hoặc là dùng tới um, những dọc, uh, công cụ mà nặng thì trong những tình trạng đó nếu người công nhân uống rượu sẽ nguy hiểm đến người công nhân và những người khác trong những tình trạng đó luật đã cho phép là có thể dùng um, bằng cách thử bằng breathalyzer là một máy mà mình thổi vô để mà thử coi cái sức lượng của một người đã uống rượu đã bao sai uh, như mình đã nói trước đây Cần Sa nó không có một cách thử tương đương giống như vậy Cho nên lúc này những công ty đang những công ty um, làm về uh, Cần Sa đang cố gắng để kiếm ra một cách để mà có thể thử được um, cách bị sai của một người hút hoặc uống hoặc dùng Cần Sa Nhưng nó khó bởi vì uống rượu vô cái thời gian mà cơ thể mình dùng đến rượu nó nhanh hơn Nhưng mà thời gian mà nhiều người uh, uống and I guess a lot of this, as you've indicated, is like the rapid response time. I mean, there's the difference of how our body absorbs alcohol versus how our body absorbs uh, medical marijuana or legalized use marijuana, and plus the quantities aren't quite 
it's not as obvious right. at this time. Right. So a marijuana impairment for one user is not the same as it is for another. Um, different users have different tolerances. and To further complicate matters, they're not labeled at this moment, the way alcohol is right. now, labeled. Le with legalization, that hopefully will, will assist in that area. Um, and particularly if we have labeling that identifies, you know, THC levels, um, that will assist in determining levels of impairment. impairment. Mm -hmm. um, but the bottom line is that that's probably going to be one of the biggest struggles facing employers um, because a positive drug test does not necessarily prove that the employee impaired. was impaired when he took the test. And right. so it's a lot harder for the employer to justify that drug testing is necessary to ensure safety. And certainly the idea that you can either ingest or use an oil or use a pill or smoke also changes the varied methods right. by Levels which your body right, right. absorbs and how impaired you become. Yes. Um, whereas I guess by and large as far as I'm concerned or know of, mostly people just ingest by drinking alcohol. Correct. The, yeah. yeah. The methods of ingestion are different. Um, okay, so the drug testing methods, this criteria, you know, it, how do you sort of interplay that with um, protecting the employee's right to privacy and how do you justify sort of random testing? Right. So, you know, employers are going to have to continue to monitor and use new technologies as they become available, um, especially testing methodologies that can show current impairment and not simply use of cannabis by employees because, you know, unfortunately marijuana stays in somebody's system long after right. the, you know, uh, the impairment effect has, has dissipated. All right. I guess it's going to be a challenge going forward, especially for places with, you know, non-sensitive, non-safety sensitive yes. workplaces. Um, uh, you know, what, what do you think that means ultimately for medical marijuana? So we've sort of talked about recreational use, how employers will be affected in a post-legalization uh, right. regime. So as you've indicated before, there are those who are, have been certified to use medical marijuana. Uh, what's the obligation on the employer's part to accommodate medical use of this drug that also has impairment side effects? Right. So uh, medical marijuana is something that employers currently have to deal with and have had to deal with for a few years. Um, and legalization is not going to affect the employer's obligation in that regard. Its obligation is going to be the same. Um, and really employers should be treating medical marijuana like any other prescription drug. Um, under Section 5 Sub 1 of the Ontario Human Rights Code, an individual has the right uh, to equal treatment with respect to their employment without discrimination because of disability. And medical marijuana, we know, can be prescribed for a variety of conditions which clearly fall within the definition of disability as contained in the code. And as a result, they engage the employer's duty to accommodate to the point of undue hardship. Um, and what is the appropriate accommodation will depend on a variety of factors, uh, including the type of workplace that's an issue, the needs of the employer, the needs of the employee, and really is to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what employers should not be doing is simply dismissing out of hand a request for accommodation when an employee presents them with a prescription for medical marijuana to treat a, a condition that is a disability. Um, so bà Susan vừa mới giải thích cho mình biết được là cần sa hiện giờ đó đã được thường dùng về lãnh vực à, uống về thuốc men rồi và những người mướn công nhân phải nhớ rất rõ là họ phải trước hết khi biết được là người công nhân mình phải dùng đến cần sa với tính cách là um, với tính cách là về thuốc men thì họ phải nhớ là thuốc men này là một thuốc chính xác của một người bác sĩ đưa giấy ra và họ phải coi đó giống như một thuốc giống như những loại thuốc khác mà người công nhân phải thường dùng tới. So you just indicated that there is a duty to accommodate uh, và những người công nhân những người công nhân mà cần thiết đến mình phải suy nghĩ đến cách nào mình có thể giúp họ để có thể làm việc trong công xưởng của mình nếu họ có giấy bác sĩ đàng hoàng để dùng đến gần xa. Um, and so up to undue hardship. I mean that doesn't seem that uh, easily defined. What sort of qualifies as undue hardship? Right. So unfortunately there are no hard and fast rules uh, determining what constitutes undue hardship isn't always easy to do and there are really three factors to be considered uh, the cost of the accommodation any outside funding that's available to subsidize the cost of accommodation and then any health and safety concerns with respect to the accommodation um, and 
it's it is not readily definable. So what constitutes undue hardship for a smaller business right. may differ may differ than what is undue hardship for a large corporation. Right. Um, and obviously when dealing with medical marijuana use in the employment context, it's really the third factor that's going to be the most significant, uh, the safety concerns. Right, okay. And that makes sense, and even that will change, again, whether or not the environment is a non-sensitive, sensitive, safety-sensitive workplace or a safety-sensitive workplace. That'll all come into right. these factors. Essentially, it's they're moving targets, and they change on a case-by-case -case basis. Right, and certainly in a safety-sensitive environment, an employer will probably still be justified in enforcing a zero-tolerance policy for drug use. Um, so if you have, let's say, a heavy equipment operator who has some very debilitating chronic back pain. Well, that person is still likely to be prohibited from uh, using prescribed medical marijuana while they're on the job. Right. Because of their position. Impairment, yes, right. of course. Okay, so I mean, what, uh, what happens? What do you do if an employee comes up to you and you're an employer? Một khi một người công nhân đến và nói cho mình biết là họ cần phải dùng thì người chủ phải làm như cách nào? Do you request further details? What's uh, what's the right way to approach it? Yeah, so, uh, and that's something a lot of employers don't really understand, that the, the duty to accommodate is a two-way street. So, you know, you as an employer need to be proactive um, in determining if accommodation is required, but the employee also has an obligation to cooperate. And a, a big piece of that sort of cooperation is providing the employer with the medical information necessary so that the employer can assess what right. sort of accommodation is required. Um, given the way uh, the legalization process seems to be going in this country, it looks like um, we're going to have a, a lot of good information available um, about the product that medical marijuana users um, are, are using. And so that's going to make it easier to ascertain uh, levels of impairment and how the use of the drug is going to affect the person's ability to do their job. Right. Um, but certainly, uh, and employers have the right to ask uh, an employee to get information from their doctor um, as to you know any limitations on um, their ability to to perform the essential duties of their job. Right. And so. This request for information can come and it can go back to, and you can ask for more information from a healthcare provider, more information from the individual and their symptoms, that sort of thing. Uh, right. I mean, ideally, the information should always be coming from the healthcare, healthcare provider. provider. And in fact, you know, you don't want to get into a situation where you're relying on information that you're getting from your employee. It should always be from the healthcare provider. Um, and quite often, you know, employers will, will give a functional abilities form to the doctor and say, all right, please complete it and tell us you know, A, what are the, the, the restrictions on this person, um, and, and then how can we accommodate those restrictions? Yeah, it's, a, it's an evolving situation, and I think that certainly when you have someone who tells you that they have, you know, chronic pain or chronic nausea, it's a little bit more difficult to put your hands on it than what I guess traditionally would have been, you know, they have the need for more traditional types of prescriptions that were, right. yes, so uh, that adds an element of mystery or adaption. Um, so how should an employer sort of assess their accommodation options? You're a tiny shop, you have three people, or you're a huge shop with 300 people, I sh I'm sure it differs. Um, it does, although, you know, I mean, there's still certain sort of um, consistent uh, criteria to consider. I mean, accommodation can take a variety of forms. Um, you know, if we're talking medical marijuana, it could involve setting aside a private area so that the employee can consume the cannabis in private away from the customers of, of the, uh, the enterprise. Sure. Um, permitting the employee to take regularly scheduled breaks, for example, in order to ingest or smoke uh, the cannabis. Um, requesting the employee to maybe ingest an oil or an edible as opposed to smoking the cannabis. Odorous, yeah. Right? right, and then obviously asking the employee to store the drug in a locked or sealed area. Um, for example, requiring the employee not to be uh, in uniform in public view while smoking. Um, but again, it, it, it's also important to, to understand that even if the employer comes to the, the conclusion that accommodating the person in their current position will cause undue hardship, that doesn't necessarily end the inquiry. 
So in that type of scenario, the employer may still be obligated to consider other options. So for example, temporarily reassigning the employee to another uh, job, um, modifying the employee's schedule, uh, or even allowing the employee to take a temporary leave of absence. And I guess then there's the final bit, which is what happens if, again, akin to alcoholism, you have an addicted employee. Right. So an addiction to cannabis obviously constitutes a disability within the meaning of the code, and so it engages the same duty to accommodate on the part of the employer. It's an illness that requires accommodation. Correct. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for being here with us today. This is My a pleasure. very fascinating area of law. It keeps changing, and employers' duties keeps changing, and you know, your uh, advice will be very important going forward, and certainly for employers to think about their situation now. So Suzanne can be reached at uh, 905-366-9700 at extension 228, and her details are available on the website at ontlaw.com. Thank you. Molly xin kính thưa quý vị khán thính giả của Đài Việt TV Canada. Cảm ơn quý vị đã hôm nay dùng thời gian để mà nghe bà Suzanne Balfataki giải thích về cần sa và làm sao một người công nhân hoặc là người chủ có thể uh, dùng và suy nghĩ đến cách nào và uh, chính sách nào để mà có thể giúp đỡ một người công nhân. Um, và Molly sẽ cảm ơn bà Suzanne và sẽ hẹn gặp quý vị của Đài TV Việt TV Canada vào kỳ tới.